All right. Welcome everyone to Noon Conference today. So for Noon Conference today, we're going to do the second in our series, our Radiology IM FM conference. Um, for those of you who watched last time, we did uh, chest imaging. Today, we're going to be doing abdominal imaging. And as a reminder, this is a collaboration between uh, radiology uh, and their chief resident, Neil Gray, uh, Franklin and the family medicine residents, and then our IM program. Um, so these are images submitted by you guys uh, that we're going to walk through. So the format, uh, Neil's going to give us about 10 minutes of teaching on some tips and tricks for abdominal imaging. And then we're going to go through five or six cases, which uh, Neil is going to read the CT scan or the imaging study, give us his teaching tips. And then I'm going to do a one to two minute quick whiteboard teaching point, which will be uh, a little bit more clinically oriented. So uh, with that, I'm going to go hand it over to Neil and take it away. Well, cool, thank you. Um, thanks for having me back. Um, you guys uh, submitted some really awesome cases um, with some great imaging. So I will try to be as concise as possible as I go through things while still hitting um, some some good teaching points and um, hopefully we'll get to all the cases. Um, so just, um, I, I just have this one slide, but there's a lot on it. So I'll, I'll just go through all these things. Um, just some imaging tips um, that, from radiology, we feel like we get a lot of questions on or, or there's confusion about. So I'll start with uh, probably the most common, um, which is what's the difference between basically a CT with contrast and a CT with and without. Um, so I'll, I'll just start by saying that a CT, especially of the abdomen and pelvis is all with and without contrast is almost never indicated. So we get all the information that we need essentially from the with contrast. So we're, um, we're seeing all the organs being perfused and, um, you know, highlighting any differences where maybe there's something hiding a cyst, a cancer. Um, and then obviously we see things that shouldn't be enhancing, enhancing like um, fluid collections or sources of infection. So really what, what we're looking for with any CT without is we're evaluating the bones, calcifications or hyperdensities that might lead us toward um, uh, a vascular cause. So for example, in the chest, forget if we talked about this last time, but um, we, on, on a dissection study, we'll do a non-contrast first because we would otherwise miss an intramural hematoma because you'll see hyperdense blood in the wall of the aorta. Um, or just outside the wall. But really in the abdomen and pelvis, there's almost no indication. And one of the questions we get is, well, what if I, you know, what, what if we can't tell, does this person have, you know, renal stone disease or pyelonephritis or possibly both? Um, so that, that might be a rare indication if you really need to look at both. Um, but what I'll say is, so a CT and ab of the abdomen and pelvis with contrast, um, is timed in the portal venous phase. So it's gone through the arterial phase. It's now in the portal venous phase and kind of early venous phase. Um, and so essentially what that means is for the kidneys in particular, there has been time for there to be cortical uptake, perfusion of the renal parenchyma, and little to no contrast has gotten into the renal collecting system. And so the concern with doing a CT contrast with, um, if you're concerned about stones, is that some of the contrast in the collecting system might obscure the stones. So that, that, is, a real, there, that is a real possibility. Um, but I would say if, if you have infection on your list um, of concerns, even if it's second to stones, I would just go ahead and get the CT abdomen pelvis with contrast. Um, the other thing that makes this really confusing is that on MRI studies, um, if contrast is given, we always do without contrast first and then with contrast. And that has, you know, for just for reasons that are, uh, you know, deeper than, than we can go into here, we get a ton of information without contrast on MR and then contrast adds information and we have to have the two to compare. Um, then we, sometimes we get questions on, um, you know, what, be it in the chest or in the abdomen pelvis, what's the difference between a CTA versus, you know, your regular run of the mill CT versus sometimes people will order a CTV or CT venogram. So CTA is CT, you know, uh, in the arterial phase. Um, so obviously that's looking for arterial causes, um, you know, potentially arterial bleeds, um, uh, uh, or aortic, um, concerns. Standard CT is the, the portal venous phase, like I mentioned. And then 
occasionally, this is pretty rare, um, you know, you might want to do a CT venogram. And that's if you're, let's say the patient has uh, renal cell carcinoma and they have tumor thrombus that's just, you know, tumor is extended into the IVC and it's crawling up the IVC and um, creating either bland or tumor thrombus and they're on anticoagulation. And you want to see, is this getting better? It'd probably be better to time this in the venous phase rather than the portal venous phase, because it's a little bit later and you can get mixing artifact in the IVC in particular that, that obfuscates the picture. Um, and so timing it to a true venous phase would be a little bit better. And essentially all the techs do is wait just a little bit longer. Um, and then uh, just so you know, there are separate protocols for GI bleeds and mesenteric ischemia. Those are just other things that you know may come up on the floor that uh, you need imaging for. Just know that there are other um, other protocols. And if if you have any doubt about what to get, just please give us a call. We're always happy to talk things through or figure it out with you. Um, another thing, probably from the medicine, family medicine side, you guys don't order this quite as much, but um, uh, CTIVP, which stands for intravenous pilogram uh, versus a CT cystogram. So an IVP is essentially part of the workup um, of hematuria. Um, and what it's looking for is very small filling defects in the renal collecting system and ureters. Um, so transitional cell carcinoma um, and less commonly squamous cell carcinoma. So that's that's a reason. So that, that's going to be a later phase in the kidneys. You're getting contrast, you know, filling the collecting system and um, the ureters so that we get uh, we get a really nice picture of the, the ureters. Cystogram is more for um, if you're concerned about bladder pathology. So the trauma teams will sometimes get these if there's concern for bladder rupture uh, with a lot of pelvic fractures. So um, the patient is catheterized. Um, they're, um, have they, their bladder instilled with contrast. We image and then we do a post void um, to, to see basically if any contrast has um, has escaped the bladder. Um, and then for, uh, for liver imaging in particular, there are these things called triple phase and quadruple phase. You may hear um, triple phase would be arterial phase, portal venous phase, and then a delayed phase, which is about three to five minutes later, um, essentially looking for HCC. You can spot other cancers this way, but HCC has uh, very characteristic imaging features that the triple phase um, takes advantage of. Quadruple phase, um, you might think, oh, hey, four is better than three. Um, that's really unnecessary unless the patient has had prior embolization with a hyperdense material. So lipiodol is, is the most common one that the IR folks will use. And it's hyperdense. It's, um, so you have to get pre-contrast imaging. So quadruple phase is the other three, but you start with a non-contrast. Um, and then also just uh, just so you know, um, we will sometimes, um, if a lesion isn't fully characterized, we'll say a renal mass protocol or adrenal mass protocol. These are additional, uh, more, more specialized um, studies, but uh, we, we don't need to go into exactly what they are. Just, just know that they're there. So with that, we can start the first case. All right, thanks, Neil. So um, for everyone, if you guys have questions for Neil throughout this process, throw them in the chat and we will try our best to answer all of them. Um, so for our first case today, and I will put the one-liner into the chat as well, we've got a 36-year-old man with no significant past medical history presenting with three days of colicky right lower quadrant pain. He has two prior episodes of this without a, a concrete diagnosis, and he's found to have an elevated fecal calprotectin. I apologize. I'm not on my normal system. I have to run this off my laptop, but um, can you guys see this okay? Yep. Okay, great. All right. Um, so I, I pulled up the coronal here because I think for uh, bowel pathology, it's it's often, um, well, in all honesty, I, I start with the coronal just because you get the most bang for your buck on just looking through the slices quickly. So I, I just get an overview of you know what's going on with this patient. Um, and in this case, um, I believe the initial concern was possibly uh, appendicitis, but obviously just going through this, they have some really dilated loops of bowel. Um, and um, here, 
this so this kind of mottled appearance is typically what we see in the colon or maybe in the stomach if, if you've you know swallowed a bunch of air and have it mis mixed with gastric contents but um this is um what i'm sure you guys are familiar with but is uh, fecalization of small bowel contents and so that's that can happen with chronic constipation with just slow transit um but it's it's definitely abnormal in the in the setting of dilated loops of bowel so um so as soon as I open this up, I'm suspecting that there is an obstruction or, um, you know, potentially a high grade ileus. That's kind of our first distinguishing, um, uh, that's kind of our first branch point is, is this ileus or obstruction? Because they obviously have different managements. Um, so what I'm looking for is I will just kind of follow one of these. And in all honesty, I don't think I ever found the transition point on this, but, um, I'll, I'll follow these loops of bowel and try to find a transition point and then follow it back the other way. Make sure there's no other transition point because they're just a closed loop or internal hernia. Um, and then um, you can also um, kind of come, come over by the colon. Here's coming down towards the cecum. And then I'm seeing the, um, the ileocecal valve right here, distal ileum. So that's all decompressed. So I know that there's some obstruction above this and it's not related to you know the colon just being backed up or to an ileus so the other things um you know we'll we'll talk about and these these are somewhat subjective and and uh, depend on who's reading the study but we may talk about mechanical obstruction um you know which is just like a physical twisting of the bowel or um or something like physically uh, obstructing the lumen. Um, then some people talk about low grade versus high grade. Um, I think that's kind of a it's kind of a tough call. And then the, then there's partial versus complete. So um, in some cases, uh, severe enteritis can cause essentially a functional small bowel obstruction. There's no true obstructing process. It's just that the the bowel is so inflamed and the walls are so inflamed that um, it's not peristalsing normally there and um, not as much can flow through there as normally. So in that, in that setting, I would say like, you know, this is a, uh, a, you know, perhaps high grade functional obstruction. So you'll see the terminology uh, differ, but that's, that's kind of what we're thinking is basically, is there, is there a discrete point where this pinches off or not? Then the other, um, the other things that we, look at it, which I alluded to, or, you know, is this, is what we're seeing the primary cause or, or secondary? So, you know, is there, um, you know, an internal hernia? Is there an obstructing mass? You know, that's the primary cause or is, or is the bowel dilation secondary to something like enteritis? The next thing um, is all these secondary signs. So, okay. So anybody can open this up and look and see, yeah, there's fecalization. There's something going wrong. These are definitely dilated. By the way, we use three centimeters for small bowel, six centimeters for colon, and then eight to nine for the cecum uh, as upper limits of normal. The other things we look for um, are uh, differences in the enhancement patterns of that bowel. So what I actually find more helpful is not is this hyper enhancing? Is it hypo enhancing? Because I think that can be kind of tough, but just compare it to other bowel um, that is normal. So in this case, I, I wouldn't say that this is hyper enhancing. This is just dilated. It doesn't look thick walled. It looks normal, um, but you're looking for bowel wall thickening and then differences in enhancement rather than hypo or hyper. Um, Adjacent stranding can be really helpful because that's that starts to clue you into where is the bowel most compromised because as uh, as the bowel becomes more distended you get uh, you know vascular compression and then you get leaky capillaries and starts to leak out into the mesentery um, so adjacent fluid is very helpful um, stranding uh, will kind of clue you into maybe where the the uh, problem is um, and then obviously a, a more significant finding is uh, very thickened walls and or pneumatosis. So pneumatosis being, you know, bowel uh, or air within the bowel wall. Um, and then just to, as a, as kind of a, an extension of that, if, if we do see that, that's very suggestive of ischemic bowel. Um, so that's a, that's a very bad sign. They need to go to surgery immediately. Um, Sometimes that will track uh, retrograde along the mesenteric uh, vessels, along the splanchnic vessels and into the portal system. And so you get portal venous gas. That is, that's an even later stage than pneumatosis. Sometimes people have had sphincterotomies, have had cholecystectomies, um, and they have new mobilia. So 
Um, it's not always 100% to tell the difference between the two, but if you're wondering, portal venous gas tends to go peripheral because um, the, the flow is directed outward toward the periphery. So think portal venous gas is towards the periphery. And then pneumobilia, um, you know, if you think about the bile ducts are trying to drain toward the common bile duct. And so those are trying to drain more centrally. And so that's where your pneumobilia is gonna be. Um, yeah, I think that I think that was it on this case. Awesome, thanks, Neil. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's head over to the whiteboard here. So uh, this gentleman gets admitted. Um, he has a pretty good workup when he gets in, and um, he has this elevated fecal calprotectin. So what do we do with this gentleman's elevated uh, fecal calprotectin? So here's a cartoon of the uh, of the of the colon, and if you imagine that you have you know inflammation in sort of these patches along the colon right here. So this inflammation uh, in the colon is typically going to be a neutrophilic predominant inflammation in most people. And so neutrophilic predominant inflammation will produce a substance, uh, which then can be excreted into the stool. And that substance is your fecal calprotectin. And so every time you are uh, ordering this and checking this, you're checking for inflammation uh, within the colon or the small bowel. So how do we use this clinically? So we really use this uh, to differentiate between IBD versus IBS. That's sort of like the initial way it was, it was documented. And so having a negative fecal calprotectin essentially rules out IBD. Um, what do you do if your fecal calprotectin is positive? So if it's positive, this person really has to go to endoscopy because you really need to get that tissue diagnosis to see what's going on. The other thing you can use it for is you can correlate it in the outpatient setting or inpatient setting with disease activity. And so if this person has a known diagnosis of IBD, you can track their fecal calprotectin or you can check it when they get admitted. So if this is a, a component of neutrophilic inflammation, the huge caveat then is that this is gonna be positive really in anything that causes infection or inflammation. And so that includes infection, it includes lymphoma, it can include celiac, allergy, and a bunch of other things. So really, it's a very nonspecific indicator, but it's got pretty good sensitivity for saying yes, no, is there inflammation present? And so for this gentleman, he gets admitted, he has a positive fecal calprotectin, he does undergo endoscopy, and he ultimately is found to have IBD on his um, pathology showing focal active ulcers uh, with some cryptitis and was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Um, unfortunately, he was lost to follow up, which is either a good or a bad thing, uh, but the final diagnosis in this case was Crohn's disease. Okay, so uh, back to Neil here for our second case. So our second case here is going to be, I'm gonna put this in the chat, a 68 year old man with atrial fibrillation, type two diabetes, a prior small bowel obstruction, DVT on anticoagulation, a prior hiatal hernia, coming in uh, with malaise, fevers, and abdominal pain. All right. Um... So this is a case of uh, intra-abdominal fluid collections and abscesses. I will say um, this may sound silly, but sometimes when fluid collections are large, they're actually harder to find. <laughs> so when I was first scrolling through this, uh, I was like, oh, they aren't really jumping out to me. Um, but let me take you back through these. So this you might think is just some fluid layering in the colon, but this is actually a large intra-abdominal abscess. Um, similarly, if we were scrolling down, um, so here's sigmoid colon. It's kind of, it's kind of hard to follow around here. And there's the rectum. So this entire fluid collection is just a thick walled, probably fecal contents in their abscess. So, um, so a couple of points on this, um, just to start kind of high level is, um, Depending on the size of the fluid collection, we don't always need contrast. That being said, I would always, always, always recommend um, contrast when you can, when the patient can afford it. Um, you know, so unless their kidneys are, you know, on the verge of dying, you're just too concerned about that. Um, we we really need to see the walls enhance of this uh, of these collections, and we really need to be able to separate them from other structures. It can be impossible, really, to tell. If something is a loop of bowel, um, a little outpouching of bowel, um, 
versus an entirely separate collection. And um, you know, depending on the population, we look at um, things that help us distinguish structures or fat planes. And so this patient, you know, he's got a little bit of fat there, a little bit of fat there, but in general, he's not a, he's not a huge guy. Um, and so he doesn't have a lot of mesenteric fat to, um, to separate out the structures. Um, so that's, that's one consideration. Um, but it, if you're worried about intra-abdominal infection, they, they need contrast. Um, so other things we look at when we talk about these collections are, um, you know, we can sometimes give a rough idea of how long this has been around, not in days or weeks specifically, but like, yeah, this looks like it's organizing. Um, uh, so, so if we see, uh, there's not an example on this one, but for example, um, if a collection has only partial peripheral enhancement, that's that gives us the sense that this is only starting to form. Like this is an early abscess; it hasn't developed a, a thick rind yet. Um, and the the rind thickness is the other piece of it. Is if they have a really thick walled fluid collection, the chances that that's been brewing for some time are are quite high. Um, we also obviously want to look for the cause of this. So I I didn't have a chance to delve too far into this guy's chart, but he had. Uh, some pneumoperitoneum a month or so prior to this, month and a half maybe. Um, and so he probably had a bowel perforation. Um, uh, I don't know if we'll ever know, but um, that would explain, um, you know, you, you get fecal contents out into the, um, into the abdominal cavity, and then they just sit there. There's no really good drainage system for those. Um, and then, you know, especially if you get fecal contents out there, those aren't going to go anywhere. So, um, so that was probably the case with him. Other really common things, uh, pancreatitis. So pancreatitis is um, when there are fluid collections, they can be numerous, they can be huge, um, they can be very persistent and um, they, yeah, they can go down into the abdomen, um, sorry, down into the pelvis. So uh, that, that's another thing to think about. Um, if the patient has cirrhosis, for example, um, you, know, you can think about SPP um, and is the society starting to become infected and start to loculate? Um, I'd say that's not nearly as common as something like pancreatitis. And then cancer, um, you know, seeding the peritoneum, seeding, seeding the omentum, uh, especially mucinous cancers, those are you know, notorious. Um, and they give you that jelly belly um, so you can get really persistent, um, difficult to treat fluid collections all over. Um, and then let me just give you a few things. I, I reached out to one of my IR colleagues um, to just to give you guys a sense of how IR approaches these, um, when they put drains in, when they upsize the drains, what they're looking for, because um, it can be kind of mysterious from their very scant notes, um, when they're gonna pull the drain, when they feel like the patient's getting better. So I'll just run through a few of these bullet points. So um, they will generally look for a fluid collection that is greater than three centimeters. Um, the other ones are, are typically managed with antibiotics and should go away. Um, let's see, next would be um, how long is the um, how long is the drain going to stay in place? So that, that totally depends. The, the rule is kind of, they look for drain output around five to 10 cc's per day or lower for two days um, before making a decision to, uh, to remove the drain. If there is five cc's of drainage over the past 24 hours or past 48 hours, but there's a ton of fluid coming around the drain. That's obviously concerning. Suggests that there's, you know, there's liquid under pressure, um, and that that needs to be readjusted. And so, in that case, they may upsize the drain um, just to keep the the tract nice and tight, so that uh, all the fluid is actually going out the drain and not into the other tissues. Um, and then, uh, in terms of, you know, when they when they'll inject the tube, uh, it's called a sinogram. Um, that that's uh, if if they have some concern, like you know, drainage is really low, nothing coming around the tube, but you know, the patient's on antibiotics and they're still fevering or still have a high white count, they might do a sinogram just to say, like, hey, you know, is this in the the correct position? Um, sometimes they'll do a repeat CT as well to. Um, to see, you know, is there a different collection that's accumulated? Are we in a loculated portion that doesn't, uh, that's not getting drained by this? Um, so those are, um, those are some of the tips. And then, um, 
hopefully the drain can come out in around seven to 10 days. That's, that's what they shoot for, but obviously anything that complicates that will, uh, will necessitate a little bit longer. Awesome. Thanks, Neil. So while we're pulling this board back up here, so it sounds like things we can do as residents to, to help you guys out is to get that CT with contrast. And then, you know, if we have concerns about uh, the person not improving or not getting better, uh, talk to you guys to figure out ways we can uh, sort of re-image and sort of reassess what's in. Yep. Exactly. All right. So next thing I want to talk about in relation to this man's course. So he had some drains placed by IR and grew Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Enterococcus fecalis, and yeast. So similar to what Neil said, prior perf with some intra-abdominal contents in those abscesses. So this trial that I have pulled up right here is referred to as the Stop It trial. And this is in 2015 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And so uh, what this trial did, we're going to do a one minute journal club review. So they took 518 patients who had a complicated intra-abdominal infection. And they uh, defined that as basically an elevated white count, fevers, or ileus, or any sort of problems with um, uh, nutrition, who had adequate source control, which means they had either an IR or G, um, C, uh, surgery procedure to control. So they had a drain place or they had a lot, um, X lap and a washout. And so they went ahead and compared, in this case, whether a three to five day course of antibiotics was any different than an eight to 10 day course. And so ultimately what they found was a three to five day course, their final outcome was death, uh, surgical site infection or repeat infection. They found that 22% of people met that final outcome. The eight to 10 day course, they found 22% as well. So identical outcomes. And so then the next question is sort of what was that median antibiotic exposure for these people? So in the three to five day group, the median was four days of antibiotics. And in the eight to 10 day group, the median was eight days of antibiotics. And so the takeaway from this trial is that in someone who has adequate source control, which was certainly not this gentleman, but in patients we see who have a drain that's draining appropriately or get that surgical procedure, a three to five day course of antibiotics uh, narrowing when cultures come back is probably adequate for most patients to adequately treat their infections. And so the stop at trial is, a, in my opinion, a practice changing study that can sort of help us decrease antibiotic exposure uh, for people with intra-abdominal infections. All right, I'm gonna throw it back to Neil for case number three. So case number three, uh, the people start to get more sick. So this is a 67 year old man with AFib, COPD, alcohol use disorder, presenting with two weeks of increasing back pain, fluid in his belly and decreased urinary frequency. He's found to have an elevated lactate, but is normotensive. All right. So this is the kind of study I hate opening because it's an abdomen pelvis and there's already way too much going on <laughs> in the chest. Um, so I'll just, you know, go through some basic things that I look at. So there are just way too many vessels. Um, it's hard to tell. There's probably a small hiatal hernia at least. Um, it's got a feeding tube in, um, but just there is way too much going on here. Um, should just be a, a collapsed esophagus some uh, some mediastinal fat, and that's about it. He's also got a pleural effusion and, um, you know, some probably infectious inflammatory uh, stuff going on in that left lower lobe. Um, he's got atelectasis and then a pleural effusion. So then coming down, the thing I'm gonna focus on here is uh, some of his liver findings. So this uh, we will often condense in our reports as just saying a cirrhotic appearing liver. But what we mean by that is, um, and I, I don't have the corona pulled up, but I, I guarantee you this liver is small. So this very nodular appearance, um, it can be micronodular and then it progresses to, not, to macronodular as cirrhosis progresses. Um, that's, that's one of the key features of you know, a truly cirrhotic liver. Um, the other thing that we don't see as well here, um, and I think because the gallbladder is filling that space, but um, where the falciform ligament comes in, um, you'll, you'll often get uh, what we call perifissural, uh, widening of the perifissural spaces. And so essentially what that is, is you, know, you have your, your um, falciform ligament coming in, that's really not gonna move. And then the liver as it fibrosis retracts away from that. So the, the separation between the left lobe of the liver and the right lobe uh, becomes more pronounced. 
Um, other things in cirrhosis in the liver itself, um, in the portal venous phase, it probably, which this is, um, it should probably be fairly homogeneously enhancing. However, you can kind of see there's like, uh, I don't know if you can see it as well, um, but there it's, it's a little less enhancing over here. Anyway, the, the point is that because the, the liver is getting more and more fibrotic, the, um, the tissue is clamping down on everything in the liver, including the vasculature. And so you can get uh, very odd appearing enhancement patterns, particularly in the arterial phase. Um, and so if, if you see that, it can look like, it can make it look like a mass and it can look like a huge infarct. Um, and I've, I'm sure I've called both wrong, but um, just know that that's, that's something that can make a liver look very funny. Um, the other, oh, and then you might see some uh, regenerative nodules or even HCC in, in long-standing cirrhosis. Um, so it's, it's not really possible to say what all these are. That might be a cyst, uh, but some of these other things might be, you know, some of the liver trying to, uh, trying to, to make a comeback. The sequelae of, um, of cirrhosis, uh, sorry, I'm trying to window this a little better. Um, uh, that, that we talk about. So splenomegaly, which this spleen is is actually not that big for a cirrhotic patient, um, but essentially as as the portal venous pressure increases, uh, more and more gets diverted into the splenic vein and you just get an engorged spleen and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, the other thing are what we call uh, just generically portosystemic collaterals. Um, so that's everything from the caput medusae to hemorrhoids to um, what we saw on this, which is, I think it's a combination of esophageal varices and paraesophageal varices. Um, and I, I believe there's some difference that I don't remember on what causes esophageal versus paraesophageal. But anyhow, you'll see just these, you know, very tortuous and engorged vessels. Um, and um, they, they can be splenorenal, they can be uh, renal into lumbar, uh, into intercostal, they can be really pronounced. Uh, we don't see it on, see them on this guy, but um, you will, you can often see a, a very uh, pronounced one or two vessels, which are the recanalized para umbilical veins, um, which just, they're just trying to divert pressure from the portal system. Um, and that's what gives you the cap at Medusa around the, around the umbilicus. Um, the other thing that, that happens with cirrhosis, and it's just this chronic inflammatory state, is lymphadenopathy. And when I was a younger resident, I had a very hard time uh, seeing lymphadenopathy because you really have to know where to look. Um, so I'll show you a couple places to look. Um, so especially in cirrhotic patients, the gastrohepatic. Um, so in this region, kind of over here, um, I'll point out some more prominent ones. And there are portal nodes. So that's a big portal node right there. See how it just kind of comes in and out, doesn't connect with any other structure. Um, and then there are, um, you know, all sorts of retroperitoneal chains, um, peri-aortic or peri-caval. Um, so all along this, this, uh, this retroperitoneum. So there's, there's one right there, if I can convince you. So basically what you're looking for, you have to first be looking in the right place. And then you have to, as you're scrolling, see, do things kind of blink in and out to make sure that they don't connect with other structures. It, it's very embarrassing to uh, call a vascular aneurysm a lymph node. Um, but anyway, extremely common in, uh, in, lymph, in um, lymphadenopathy is very common in cirrhosis. And so we often say that they are just likely reactive, um, but it, it can be tough because, you know, maybe they have concomitant cancer, maybe they have colon cancer, uh, maybe they have um, something else. So uh, something that we, we try not to be too flippant about, but just know that they can get a pretty pronounced lymphadenopathy just from cirrhosis. Then real quick, um, just talking about the density of the liver. Um, so fatty liver, um, is, is most commonly the result of uh, excess alcohol intake. And when, when we look for that, we look for measuring the Hounsfeld units, which is our measurement of density um, of the liver to be less than 40. Um, and that's on a non-contrast exam. On a contrasted exam, if it's less than 40, it's most certainly fatty liver because you have contrast there and the contrast still isn't making the liver bright enough to be above the threshold. Um, but if it's, and then if it's, let's say it's 50, 
but the spleen is 80 when there's a differential and different people use different numbers. Um, but when there's a high enough differential between the spleen and the liver, you can call fatty liver as well. Um, and we'll see on a, on a different case, a truly fatty liver. But remember as, uh, as the liver gets more cirrhotic, it's getting more fibrotic. And so it's getting denser and denser. And so you will not see a low density cirrhotic liver uh, except in very rare cases. Um, and uh, yeah, there, there were also um, some venous clots on this exam, which is uh, um, probably from this guy's underlying, uh, I believe he had cancer, but there's, there's a splenic vein clot, um, kind of hard to, to show you. And then there's one right there. So at the, at the portal, the porto splenic confluence where this, the splenic vein and the portal vein, um, he just has a, he has a bunch of clot and it's, it's coming down into his uh, SMV. So that's not good. Wow, that was that was a lot. I uh, <laughs> it's funny because I think we get these scans all the time, and we can maybe see the nodular liver, but uh, actually pointing out like the various um, complications of cirrhosis on that is incredibly helpful. So where did this guy's lactic uh, acidosis come from? So as a reminder, he had both cancer and cirrhosis. And so when we talk about uh, lactic acidosis, there's the type A lactic acidosis, and then there's your type B lactic acidosis. And so we're about to have a case with a pretty clear type A, but in this case, this gentleman has a type B lactic acidosis. And so why are we confident that he has a type B when he comes in? It's because he's normotensive and perfusing. So if you are normotensive and perfusing, then you go down this type B pathway. So how do I think about that type B pathway? So I break it down into sort of cellular metabolism problems, clearance problems. And then my third is usually overproduction or because it's so, um, most of these causes are drugs, I make that third case just drugs. So if you have a type B, this is how I break it down. So really briefly, cellular metabolism problems, alcohol. So at Denver Health, we see this all the time. DKA, malignancy, and malignancy causes it for something called the Warburg effect, in which basically cancer cells inappropriately utilize glycogen uh, to produce lactate, or so they sort of go down this anaerobic pathway with uh, glucose and glycogen, and then thiamine deficiency, so sort of that classic berry-berry picture. The clearance problem, so like this gentleman, is sort of any sort of cause of liver dysfunction. And then in the drugs, we get into beta agonists, propofol infusion syndrome, which I think we'll probably see once or twice through our residency, metformin, the one we're all familiar with, and then some weirder causes like linazolid, heart therapy, and uh, very last one is nipride, which causes a lactic acidosis via cyanide toxicity. And so I would encourage you guys, if you have a lactic, uh, unexplained lactic acidosis in your patient, really try to figure out which one of these branch points you're going to follow, and then try to put a name to that lactic acidosis so you can sort of accurately explain every lab abnormality. All right, Neil, let's get to case four here. So, and remember, uh, if you guys have any questions for Neil, uh, throw them in the chat and we will ask him while he is reading. All right, so I told you guys that the people get more sick and that is true. And so this gentleman now is gonna be uh, a 43 year old man with type one diabetes, porphyria cutanea tarda, not trait, admitted with sepsis. Unfortunately, he has a PEA arrest on hospital day one ROSC is obtained and he's transferred to the MICU. In the MICU, he's stabilized, but his lactate is persistently 10 on norepinephrine and vasopressin. All right, so not a, not a great picture to start, um, although that clinical history is, is incredibly important, excuse me, in, in cases like this. And like I said last time, you know, we, we really do our best to, um, you know, jump into the, sh the chart and see the most recent progress note, um, you know, H&P, try to, try to see, but, you know, if you figure we're reading, you know, 100 studies in a, in a shift, it can be a lot. So um, having the history of PEA in this case is is crucial. But let's start with um, let's start with this liver. So um, let me show you. Let me see if my shortcuts work. Um, so it looks big to me. Let's measure. So this is how we measure it. Um, so we measure roughly, uh, you know, inferior right liver edge to the hepatic dome in roughly the mid clavicular line. Anything over 18 centimeters, we start to say hepatomegaly. So this guy has a big liver and, um, can I get rid of that? no, okay. Um, the other thing you'll notice is, let's see, um, it's got a funny looking spleen, but see how much brighter that is than the 
liver. So this liver is 11 Hounsfeld units, which is well below 40, and he has contrast on board. So um, that uh, that is a that is a very fatty liver, um, and so he, he has that as an underlying issue. But just a nice comparison to the prior. Um, so then the the focus here is actually on bowel findings. So um, look at the basically the entirety of the colon. So we have descending colon. We'll follow the transverse colon across. So that bowel, first of all, for col colon should be paper thin. Um, when there is this much thickening and hypoattenuation, there's something very wrong going on. So this is why I said the, the history in this case is so important because we can't distinguish between a, a bad pan colitis and um, ischemic colitis. Um, I mean, obviously if we saw a clot, um, that would lead us one way. And if the history had nothing to do with um, decreased perfusion, it would lead us the other way as well. But in this case, um, his colon is way too thick. The You can see the mucosa is still enhancing, but there's all this bowel wall edema thickening. Um, and then there's, the, there's ascites, which is maybe from the liver, but uh, my guess is that at least some of that is from a uh, very distressed bowel. Um, and so when, when we're looking, um, you know, the, the jejunum is typically pretty thick walled. Um, the remainder of the small bowel is not thick walled and the colon should never be thicker than that. Um, it, like I said, it truly should be paper thin. Sometimes in cases of uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, um, you'll get fatty deposition just through, or, or chronic recurrent um, uh, colitis or um, uh, other, other sources of you know, inflammation, infection will give you fatty deposition just from the repeated inflammation and, and like essentially trauma. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, if, if you see bowel like this, it's, it's extremely abnormal. And then um, just to show you the small bowel findings, um, Let's see, let's go to the next patient who um, will start this big uh, lucency here is, um, I believe it's a Minnesota balloon, um, which you guys probably know much more about this than I do, um, but essentially to stop uh, vigorous GI bleeding uh, in the esophagus or GE junction. So this guy uh, ended up getting 60 units. Um, he was put on comfort care and I actually he was reversed a couple of days later. So he must have turned around, but young guy, um, unclear what the source of his bleeding was, but he also has a huge liver. Um, I believe he was a chronic drinker, but um, this, this look to the small bowel. So it's both enlarged, it's a little thickened, it's hyper enhancing. Um, this is uh, what, what you guys probably have already thought of now is shock bowel. Um, the preferred terminology now is CT hypoperfusion complex. Doesn't sound nearly as cool, but um, and you know I've I've always wondered why in a hypoperfusion state would you get hyper enhancement of bowel wall. Um, so I, I actually asked one of my attendings recently, and I, I found an article that I I will just read the paragraph because it, it says it a lot better than I can. Um, so the hypovolemia results in um, uh, sympathetic stimulation causing splanchnic vasoconstriction and reduced bowel perfusion. And then once that's severe, the um, basically the decrease in oxygen delivery causes you know, the beginnings of bowel breakdown. And so you get increased vascular permeability and interstitial fluid leaks into the bowel walls, including the contrast. And then it, there's no there's no good drainage there. So you get contrast leaking into these, you know, essentially dying bowel walls, and then it just hangs out there. Um, you can also get, um, you know, shock uh, adrenals, which I forget if this guy had. Um, anyway, you can get shock other organs, but uh, shock bowel is, is the most uh, pronounced feature here. Awesome. Thanks, Neil. So uh, the teaching point here, uh, we're going to round out our differential for a lactic acidosis. So if we uh, pull back to our board here. So when you're going type A, I think as Neil wonderfully just described, right, you are dealing with uh, under perfusion. And so whether that is true hypotension or perfusion relative to your state, you are under perfused. And so a nice way to remember your under perfused states is the shock acronym. And so uh, in the shock acronym, S septic, 
H, hypovolemic or hemorrhagic, O, obstructive, C, cardiogenic, and then K, sort of the cop-out answer is combos because our patients can also often have a combination of a lot of these things. So all of those things will cause underperfusion in that shock bow or that shock liver picture. In addition, seizure, when the person is sort of so metabolically revved up and seizing, uh, that can also cause a lactic acidosis that clears quickly because again, you are underperfusing relative to your degree of activity. And the last thing in this case, which prompted the scan is any sort of dying tissue or dying bowel. And so if you have a persistent lactate, the person's hypotensive, and even though you're perfusing them better, it's not clearing, that's when you need to start thinking about things dying inside of the abdomen. Okay, and with that, we're gonna to go to our last case here. And so Miranda asked a great, great question in the chat about pancreatitis, and we are going to get to that right now. So this is an 82-year-old woman with a history of a brain abscess or ventriculitis on vanc, ceftriaxone, and flagyl OPAT for almost four to five weeks, presenting with a three-day history of right upper quadrant abdominal pain radiating to the back. All right, this is a super cool case, uh, I think. Um, so uh, just to start, you know, we, we don't often see this, but this is what a pericardial effusion looks like. There's often, you know, I'd say like probably a third of this much fluid normally in the pericardial sac, but uh, you know, this is, I'd say, small, small, moderate, uh, definitely worth mentioning and perhaps even calling you guys um, just to make sure that uh, you're, you're aware. Um, anyhow, um, so coming down, um, you know, I, I tend to go very quickly at first and then just see what catches my eye. And just coming down through here, a couple of things are already catching my eye that I'd like to point out. So see see all this area? So this kind of uh, porta hepatis uh, region. Um, this looks just a lot uh, smudgier to use a technical term than the, you know, retrorenal uh, fat back here and over here, and even the, the fat in the, the left uh, upper quadrant. So there's something going on, maybe nothing, maybe something we'll see. Um, then I'm starting to see that smudginess of the fat over here. So just fat stranding. Um, and then boom, we have some very, very uh, prominent gallstones. Nobody's gonna miss those. Um, and so, so the, the question, uh, oh, the other thing was about um, the, the pancreatic duct. So that catches my eye. You know, we use measurements to, uh, to say whether the pancreatic duct is prominent. Uh, and if it measures above four-ish millimeters, we'll say it's dilated. I, it really shouldn't be visible most of the time. Again, sometimes in people who have had cholecystectomies, um, they just get uh, more, like uh, just greater prominence of their CBD and it just persists throughout life. And that sometimes backfills a little bit into the, into the pancreatic duct and makes it a little more prominent. Um, but even with, uh, you know, severe atrophy of the pancreas, we, sh we shouldn't really see this. So that catches my eye too. And then, um, so what's what's going on up here? Um, where, where was that? Um, so all that that smudginess that I was talking about. And then, so that's that's going to clue us into you know this is probably pancreatitis. I mean something has to be causing that. You could get uh, duodenitis uh, in the in this in the same region to give you that picture, but that duodenum looks uh, looks pretty normal to me. Um, obviously history is very helpful here. Light base is super helpful. Um, but then we have some free fluid around the edge of the pancreas too. So uh, obviously you guys know most common causes of, of pancreatitis or gallstones and uh, alcohol. So in this case, we're like, well, yeah, it's got a bunch of gallstones, probably, um, probably that. Um, so What's really cool about this case, um, in particular, because we don't see this very often, um, let's see, let's see here. So um, right there, we we almost never see this on CT, but um, so this is common bile duct coming down, coming down, coming down, and then there's a filling defect. So there's a stone in the distal CBD. There are actually probably a couple. Um, and I'll show you this on the coronal because I, th I think it's actually uh, better appreciated there. Um, so then just things that we comment on. Um, so there, there's prominence of the extrahepatic biliary system, so the common bile duct, uh, but there's no backfilling. It's not so severe that it's causing biliary dilation in the uh, intrahepatic bile ducts. 
So here it is on coronal. Let's see if we can find that. Oh, there's a nice arrow that somebody put. So this is a this is a very prominent CBD. We can measure it. Um, it really it shouldn't be above around six millimeters. Um, if people are older, we we let that go a little bit higher. And um, if they've had a cholecystectomy, it will be prominent and it can be quite a bit bigger. But as long as it's stable, it's fine. We also look for how it tapers toward the toward the duodenum, um, toward the sphincter. Um, and if it tapers smoothly, we feel better about it. If it's a very abrupt caliber change, we think um, you know maybe there's a an ampullary cancer, maybe there's a pancreatic head mass. Um, so in this case, we have multiple stones filling the distal CBD. You almost never see this on CT, which is why this is so great. Um, and then just you know showing you another another view here. Uh, there's just way too much stranding around the the head of the pancreas. So this would all be consistent uh, with gallstone pancreatitis. Um, if you told me their their light base was totally normal, um, you know, it, then I'd probably still tell you that this was pancreatitis and it's just more of acute on chronic because they burned their pancreas, their pancreas out uh, just you know with all these gallstones going in and out all the time, repeat pancreatitis and then their light base uh, doesn't doesn't uh, it's not as um, it's not as high as it probably would be in somebody else. So then just um, uh, a quick plug for um, for this kind of imaging. I think this mostly happens out of the ED, but just so that you guys know, um, like I said, we almost never see this on CT. So when we when we see these findings, you know, we might recommend MRCP or ERCP. Obviously, the GI docs want an MRCP often, especially if it's overnight, um, before uh, before they do anything. So an MRCP is going to be super helpful, um, gives us really, really nice delineation of the bile ducts, um, and will show filling defects. I believe, uh, just based on the way people tend to order it, that the way it comes up in Epic um, when you go to order it is it's probably combined MRCP plus liver. Um, but if you're just evaluating the bile ducts, unless you're concerned about cholangitis or um, some other liver pathology, you really don't need the liver. And in fact, it's just, it's a much more expensive test. It, um, you know, it may include contrast, which the patient doesn't need, um, and the likelihood of it getting red um, more expediently is lower because only body trained MR people are going to are going to read that, whereas an ED like an ED radiologist should be able to read an MRCP. Um, so that, that should, I'll just throw that out there um, in case that's a, a dilemma where you're like, oh, I'm not sure what to get. You can just get the MRCP; it just evaluates the bile ducts, and then we can go from there. Uh, Neil, good question in the chat here. Um, when should our residents be thinking about oral contrast for abdominal CTs? Yes, that is a great question. Um, I chose not to address that because it's so complicated. <laughs> I feel like it's kind of on a on a case by case basis. Um, so when when it really helps is if you are concerned about or if on prior imaging there's been concern raised about um, some kind of GI cancer. So um, uh, obviously, if if the loops are are decompressed or if there's just stool in there, we don't get a really good delineation of, of say an intramural lesion. So that can be incredibly helpful. Um, in your younger patients, especially thin ones who don't have um, a lot of intra-abdominal fat. Um, so we, we do this all the time in kids, but um, for your younger patients who are skinny and you're thinking appendicitis, I would do it then because uh, that appendix can get squished in with everything else and uh, can be really hard to find. Um, if you're concerned about ileus or obstruction, it's, I you know, I tend to tell people just if the patient can tolerate it, it is helpful. Um, if, if we see contrast getting past a, what we think is a transition point, we can say that's not a, that's not a high grade mechanical obstruction. There is at least some contrast getting past there. Um, and then if you are concerned about intra-abdominal infection um, and you can't give intravenous contrast, um, you know, for kidney reasons, then it's it's very helpful because like I was saying er, on one of the earlier cases, if we see contrast in the bowel and then we see some bowel looking collection, that might be the only thing that clues us into saying like, oh, hey, there's an abscess sitting there or a big, big fluid collection. Um, and then one last thing, um, just since we are talking about um, oral contrast, uh, we treat that the same as uh, in terms of allergy, contrast allergy, we treat that the same as intravenous.
Um, I did not know that until my third year, um, but apparently it's extremely rare that you would get any kind of reaction from enteric contrast, but I don't know. I think it's a CYA thing. Um, so just know that if, if they can't get it for kidney reasons, but you really want oral contrast, they may have to go through the prep. Awesome. Thanks, Neil. So uh, in the last minute here, we're going to do one more quick teaching point. So we talked about stop it early on. And so our last teaching point here is what are the IDSA guidelines for intra-abdominal infections and biliary infections? And so the way to think about it is, is it a moderate infection or is it a severe infection? So if it's moderate, you want to use your ceftriaxone or you can use a fluoroquinolone plus flagyl. If it's severe, you want something that covers pseudomonas. So that's going to be a carbapenem or zosin. And then you also want to give these people flagyl. And so in this person's case, why did they end up with these biliary stones? And what I will propose to you is a new uh, illness that I had not heard of, sorry, a new um, uh, medication side effect that I had not heard of, which is something called ceftriaxone induced uh, pseudo, sorry about that, uh, pseudolithiasis. So one of the weird side effects of ceftriaxone is that it can cause, um, with extended courses, essentially uh, calcium uh, crystallization in the biliary tree. And so if you're on uh, ceftriaxone for a long time on an OPAC course, you can start having these ceftriaxone crystals in your biliary tree, which can lead to stasis, sludge, and stones. And so uh, just another side effect to watch out for in these patients. Um, how do you treat it? You stop the ceftriaxone uh, and monitor. If you think they have other reasons for uh, stones, then you, like Neil said, you get your MRCP, you involve your GI colleagues. In this case, um, our patient had an ERCP uh, and uh, improved over the next few days. So a huge thank you to Neil today. So what did we cover in this conference? Um, you know, we talked about um, the bowels and, and uh, Crohn's disease and calprotectin. We talked about the stop at trial lactic acidosis uh, and um, some IDSA guidelines. And then Neil did a wonderful job teaching us about uh, the liver, uh, the spleen, the bowels, shock liver, et cetera. Um, I know Neil gave a bunch of good teaching points. I think I probably missed some of them because I was trying to remember the better the, the first ones. Um, and so we are going to post this uh, online after I take out some patient identifiers. And um, yeah, that'll be there for you guys to review uh, at any point you want. So with that, a huge thank you to Neil. If anyone has any additional questions, uh, we'll be on for a couple more minutes.